today's a special podcast because Redgrave is the only one who knows what's really going on. Well, you know what's really going on. Oh, that's true. So there's two of us. Yeah, there are, there are two people who apparently know what's going on. <laughs> so I sent Richie the link. Now we wait for him to come in. You know, I'm starting to think, Sin, that the only way you can get me on your podcast is by not telling Rich that I'm coming. Oh my god! Hi, Richie! Hi. Hi, Richard. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm alright, thank you. When she, when she said it was like a surprise Dark Souls person, I wasn't expecting you, because I associate you with Bloodborne, so I was thinking, like, it's gonna be Jeremy. <laughs> And I was very, like, sketchy about it. I'm like, well, you know. Yeah. Or possibly Gary again, just to, like, bother someone who's a professional podcaster and then get, like, 300 views of it. <laughs> oh, damn. Before we start, Richie, I wanted to ask your yeah. Red Grave's okay. opinion on something. Okay. Uh-huh. No, no, it's nothing bad. Um, I'm trying to send you a Bloodborne link. Could you click the link, please, and tell me when it loads? Uh, there's a dialogue I wanted you to take a look at real quick, uh, because... Okay. Well, you can tell me now, no, no, you have to I look at it, because um, you have to read it out. Okay. Tell me when it's open. Alright, God. Yep, yep, yep. So is that a way for him to look away from this screen? Is that is that what the trick is? Oh, are you gonna add Jeremy or Aegon or something? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hi, this is, uh, I'm Kyan. Oh my god, hi! <laughs> Hello! Hello! Nice to meet you, Kaya. Nice to meet you, Oh my too. god. Oh, Richie, did you expect that one? You have a very antagonistic relationship with me. <laughs> <laughs> you bring people to just like... <laughs> like, is this your way of tormenting Richard? Is by just secreting people onto the podcast and like playing pranks on him? Okay, I will tell you what happened. I'll tell you. One time, like six months ago, maybe more, Richie said that my bullying was getting stale. Uh-huh. Oh, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Are you, so what you're saying is he gave you purpose. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, oh, hi, Kyan. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> I just found this link laying around and it just kind of happened. Also, Kyan, there's a surprise here for you because you didn't know Redgrave was going to be here. No, I did not. Nobody knew I was coming, apparently, except yeah. for Sin. Yeah. So, Kyan with Redgrave, uh, Redgrave, Kyan. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. So, hi, Kyan, welcome. Um, do you mind telling us what we're talking about here today? I want to talk about one of my favorite things, and that is the level design of Dark Souls. Particularly the, the the big overarching level design of Dark Souls. Oh, that's so cute. But, Kyan, you're a true member of the Snack Covenant, aren't you? Uh, no, because I'm poor and I'm not on your Patreon. I don't think I'm allowed to... No! <laughs> don't say that! No! I'm also not on the Patreon. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Patreon's on blast right now. Yeah, so... But no, I, I listen all the time. I get really excited whenever I see a new episode. I don't feel bad about doing this, because you should have seen this coming. Kyan, look at me, Kyan. Are you looking at me? Okay, I'm looking. What are we talking about today? Uh, well, I think we're talking about the level design of Dark Souls 1, but I am I wrote all of three notes because I knew it could all be a waste of time. So, what are we talking about today, Sin? I made the mistake twice of taking a lot of notes, <laughs> and never again. I have no <laughs> notes because you just said it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kyan, what are we talking about today? Think about every conversation we've had, and think about who's here, and think about who I am. Oh, we're talking about Vor. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> I just, I had no idea how late it was already. <laughs> One last chance, Kyan. I don't know. I'm very afraid. 
Okay. Okay. Since plot twist, Redgrave is also someone who actually knows what's going on today. Against my will. (laughs) Have you stuck me on the Reborn podcast? Like, what's going on here? Redgrave, can you tell us what we're really talking about today? (laughs) Apparently, we are talking about I want to be the guy today. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yes. What hype. Woo. Really? And I am on record as saying that it is a terrible idea to invite Kyan on here, not telling him what the subject of the podcast is. <laughs> also, this is going to be the first episode of Gaming in the Elts in Years of 2020. Yay! Nice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So now that we're all on the same page... I don't know, are we? Are there any more secrets that you're not (laughs) telling us? I don't know, Richie. Is my bullying getting stale? There's layers upon layers of bullying going on here. (laughs) Alright, so yeah, we're talking about I want to be the guy. Yay! Hooray! Yay! Hey! Um, Kyan, could you tell us a little bit about who you are? <laughs> I am uh, I'm Michael O'Reilly. I go by Kane online, and uh, all of my notoriety basically just comes from making a really hard game in 2007, and it just kind of hit at the right time. There's a lot of games that I feel like could have gotten the spot I got, but I hit it just mm. the right time when YouTube L- mm-hmm. LPs were starting up and everything like that. And, you know, uh, it was there's all sorts of these weird trolley meta games coming out at the time. But like, I guess I want to be the guy who was one of the first ones to really be a very full game, like the beginning and end and some length to it. So it just kind of hit at the right point And. My influence, for better or for worse, mostly worse, has been felt ever since, <laughs> especially in indie games. Did you have anything to do with I Want to Be the Boshi? I actually don't know off the top of my head. Uh, no. Then my thing is, like, you can make fan games. My only thing is, like, just don't call the game I Want to Be the Guy. That's So if you see I Want to Be the Blank, right. that's a fan game. But, but I think I think you're right, though, that that really was, because I think, like, Cat Mario came out around the same time. Which was kind of a similar thing. Yeah, it yeah. Came, it came out while I was making it. Yeah, I think the original, um, the original like Super Mario Brothers one, uh, Kaizo Mario, came out a little bit before. There was uh, Awada, the life ending adventure. I talk about a lot that came out before. That was my direct inspiration. But like, uh, the thing I always say is, if I didn't do it, somebody else would have. But I did it, so I get all the credit. Well, you deserve the credit. It is a fantastic game. Yeah. So when when was Kaizo Kaizo Mario was after you, wasn't it? Or during or Yes, because I don't have any Kaizo blocks, and if Kaizo Mario came um before me, which I thought it did for a moment, but then I realized the fact it's like, oh, I never did a Kaizo block gimmick. I totally would have if it came out beforehand. <laughs> What's that? It's when you go to jump over a pit, and then there's an invisible coin block that you hit, and you get the little ding like you did something good, and then you immediately die. And it just has perfect comedic timing. And the discontinuity between the sound of getting a coin from an invisible block, usually something that's associated with finding something good, and immediately dying, creates a great type of irony. It's one of the funnier early um, little, like, meta troll tricks that people came up with you said that you made a really hard game but i think that's underselling it because i think the main thing about i want to be the guy at least for me when i first played it like a decade ago which is terrifying now to think about is is wasn't that how difficult it was it was how funny it was it's kind of i i hate to say this but part of it reminds me of how people respond to Dark Souls, seeing sure. it now like it's totally. like a decade later almost, right? Where it's like you have this game that does all these great things, and what do people walk away with? Oh, it's really hard. Yeah. 
And it's like, uh, that's like a really small. The memory I have of it is I was in college and we were all, we would all, we were all crowded around my friend Chris's laptop playing it, taking turns playing it. And the thing that it was so brilliant when, because you, it's the first level and you're dodging underneath the apples. And then you finally get to the end and you're jumping on the pillars and one of the apples falls up and kills you. It seems like such a such an obvious mild joke now, but really at the time everybody was super mad at me about it. It was it and it was so funny and it was so fun yeah. to pull new people over <laughs> and <laughs> have them play that first level and it it was just so funny. Oh, yeah, it was great watching Sin play it. I love that even to this day, I still sometimes get to see fresh plays of the game. <laughs> it's incredible. And it's like you do this thing where you think you're getting something, and then you throw a curveball when it's like there's a little trick in the end. Or like with the blocks, I thought it was smart. I'm like, I'm going to write that pattern on parchment paper. And I feel like you have foreseen people like are going to do that. So you change up the pattern in the middle of it, and like, it doesn't work. Yeah, and, like, the big secret with hard games is, like, anybody who's tried to make a game before would realize making a hard game is extremely easy. It's, in fact, almost too easy. You're probably going to make your game too hard just <laughs> because that's how it just tends to go. Um, the trick is making a hard game people are willing to play. And that goes for basically every hard game that's been successful. It's like, what is the thing you're doing that makes people get the um the resolve to push through and that can be being funny that can be being rewarding it can be all these different things but yeah i want to be the guy primarily was me telling jokes just through game design which is i thinking back at it, i think it's incredible because it's like it's one of the first it's like the first game i finished making <laughs> which is like i really don't think i should have been able to pull it off and if i tried it now it wouldn't it's just like it was like blue oceans, like not a lot of people had seen it yet. So like all of us that were at the ground floor of this sort of comedy hard game thing, like we were all making stuff up and because it was just so new and fresh, it was, it stuck really well. Yeah. I, I remember you saying like a couple of weeks ago that like the way to do funny games is not to write funny games. It's to design funny games. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah right because like what's unique to games it's like interaction and you can write jokes and they're mm. funny but like like there's like old doom wads that are funny right yeah i, re I remember someone talking about just a doom wad where um it's just a hallway full of little alcoves and in every alcove's an imp and you have a shotgun so you build up this nice rhythm of running turning shooting the alcove shooting an imp shooting an imp shooting an imp and when you get to the last one it's just a lamp <laughs> and it's like right it's just like it's barely a joke but because it's you're just not expecting it well it's not even that's barely a joke because the fact that people laugh at it even being told it it's like it's a right. joke but it's so little but since you're building up that motion in the player and that repetition just subverting it just a little bit is enough to elicit a great response <laughs> mm. yeah i think that might also be like why um uh, people got into the multiple deaths in Dark Souls because a lot of those are quite funny, yes. particularly in Sense Fortress. Sense Fortress. Yeah. yeah, which was, yeah. Very which, as well I said, is my favorite place to invade in Dark Souls One. Yeah, <laughs> which I think is like a curse upon people. I invade. That's mean. <laughs> <laughs> Just yes, yeah, I want to be the guy, guys, invading you in Sense Fortress. I guess when you phrase yourself as the the guy who made I want to be the guy, it makes perfect sense that you would invade me. Did you play Dark Souls Two? Because you seem like a Rat Covenant fan. I never got into it as much, but as soon as I found that that was a thing, I definitely tried yeah. it out. It never, it never clicked with me as well as Sense Fortress. Like, um, Sense Fortress to me became like the the Fire Swamp from the Princess Bride. I could live comfortably there for quite some time. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so Sin, as the person who has played all of four screens of the game, you have the <laughs> freshest, the newest perspective on it. Yeah. And you didn't even go the classic route. You went the down route, which is really? the, the much harder route. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I'm hardcore. She didn't. She didn't know. She I, at oh the very God, beginning right? of it, she almost figures it out. Yeah, because I didn't realize. Because you jump up at out. the start, and then you say, "Can I?" Yeah, you say, "Can I go back?" Oh, I guess I can't. And then you just continue onward. Wow. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Also, I had difficulty because I didn't place my fingers correctly. What do you mean? I'm sorry. I'm going to need a little more information than that. She didn't realize her keyboard had a left shift. What? She was trying to play with right shift and oh. her fingers on the right, like, <laughs> directional arrows. So. Oh, don't do that. It's just, it's a, like, it's a computer keyboard, you know, and I'm just not used to it. So it was like, I was just confused. <laughs> I forgot huh. that there's a left shift. <laughs> so it was very difficult at first. Huh. I mean, it was still difficult after, but... And then I thought it was, like, designed this way, because it's supposed to be a very hard game, right? So I'm like, I guess you have to coordinate your right hand. Yes, also it's co yes, Exactly. It's it, Also, there's a Mount Your Friends level in it. Yeah, no, I really, really like the game, though. I mean, if I had more time, I would totally platinum it. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, get all the trophies, like, actually beating the game, and I guess that's it. Well, no, you need you need to record every second of you trying to get no deaths on fire. Oh <laughs> god! I've never actually managed to to beat it on impossible. There's, it's like one hand, I think, the amount of people. Yeah, it's it's hard. Like I yeah. think I think I the one time I really gave it a go, I think I died at Crade Geef. Yeah, I think four bosses is probably as much as I've done. Wait, Kyan? Yeah. Kyan? yeah? Have you even beaten your own game? Oh, God, yeah, multiple times. On hard without dying? Oh, not without <laughs> dying, no. I die a lot. I die a lot in every game I play. I, I am not somebody precious about not dying. <laughs> like, when we're talking about Dark Souls games, like, the, the advice I give everybody is like, don't care about your souls and just die. Just like, who cares? <laughs> like, you, yeah. will learn, you will learn everything so fast if you just stop caring about dying and stop being a coward. Just go for Stayed. it. Okay? Right? And, I, and I play like hard games like that. The games are designed, the Souls games at least, are designed for you to be able to totally beat it with just the souls you get from bosses. Yeah. And anything else you get is just a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so any hard game, I'm just experimenting, and I probably die more than the, an average player does in pretty much any game I play, and I probably still end up getting through games faster than the average people that play them. Like, it actually is faster to fail really rapidly than it is to proceed cautiously. In most games, I'm sure there's exceptions. Yeah, yeah. Rich and I did uh, Dark Souls on Soul Level 1. That's a really fun run. Did you guys beat that? Yeah. Yes, eventually. Oh, oh my god, eventually. Oh. <laughs> well, we we were in the kiln for about 2 hours cuz you were you were drinking. Oh, well that'll do it. I was going to be like the kilns where you got hung up. <laughs> oh, drinking. Okay. No, it was the alcohol where they got hung up. <laughs> we we killed Seath on our first attempt and then she decided to celebrate. <laughs> yep. So, Kyan, I have a very important question for you. Yes? What do the apples represent? Uh, well, they're not apples. They're more like giant cherries. Oh, my God. Does that mean that somewhere in the game is hidden like a giant Japanese slipper that the cherry goes into? Sadly, no. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to disappoint you. No, that, that, that's been a joke for a long time about the game. Like, it's, it was in the fact years ago. Where someone's like, because the joke yeah. was actually somebody yelled at me, like, apples don't fall off. And my response to that was, they're more like giant cherries, as if that was an answer to anything. <laughs> the official statement is that they are delicious fruit. Uh, the kids eat them. I, I, I forgot what lore I wrote for this. <laughs> but, like, they poke them down carefully. They have to, like, boil them two times or something like that to get the poison out. Because it's a contact poison that kills you. It's an allergic reaction. Oh. That makes you explode in right. a million Same. pieces. Right, because I did the great thing of just, like, anytime someone asked me a question, I would just give some sort of bullshit answer. Have you thought of writing a cookbook? I want to be the guy cookbook? No, that would be for my sister. She's the one who bakes. Oh, okay. 
So what games inspired you to make I Want to Be the Guy? Uh, Owada, The Life Ending Journey, which was an unfinished game at the time that um, was popular on um, 4chan. Back when going on 4chan didn't mean you were some sort of weird hell person. <laughs> So we're going like way, way back when that was just word. Like 2005. Yeah, right. And that's it. And they, they had like a flashboard. People would upload yeah, this game yeah. from Japan there all the time. And I like I found it like really captivating because it did a lot of really cute um, things referencing old games. And the graphic style looked like um, 2chan emoticons and stuff like that. Really adorable. Uh, but it wasn't finished, and there's just a lot of like interesting stuff left on the table. Like I saw a lot of possibilities in this thing that was basically a small demo. So I made I Want to Be the Guy. And the funny story behind that was, years later, the, the guy who made Owada, King, he got inspired by me releasing I Want to Be the Guy and saying that Owada was my inspiration, that he finished Owada, and the last boss is the kid. So the oh, game wow, that directly great. inspired I Want to Be the oh. Guy ends with i want to be the guy that's beautiful that's really cool it's really cool and we can barely talk because like um we don't share language but we still follow each other and like each other's stuff on twitter and stuff i was i was looking at a uh WiiWare game called Pol Pol no daiboken but that comes after you by a couple of years that sounds really familiar it's similar to what you've done, but it's not actually hard. You just sort of die a lot in comedic uh, yes, ways I, I, and yeah, pick up I where you left it, off. Yeah, 2009. Yeah, it, do, it does similar things to, like, yeah, like the apple falling up, where you'll, like, you'll be in a desert and every cactus is something in the background, you walk past them, but then, like, the sixth cactus is in the foreground and just kills you as soon as you walk into it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and the sad thing is, like, even though there's, like, some games like this, like, all the, um obvious successors so i want to be the guy that have come out yeah mostly focus on the difficulty even most of the fan games that come out which is yeah. why when people ask me it's yeah. like, oh but it's funny why do you talk about the difficulty it's like well that's sadly mostly what the um the influence is and it's also the idea that rapid dying and the ability to restart without a lot of repercussions like that goes right into super meat boy and stuff like that like and like this is the yeah. design trend mm -hmm. in general. Like again, like none of this stuff is new. It's just, um, but that was starting to catch on. People realize, like, oh, you, if you change these factors, people's tolerance for difficulty changes. Because even in 2007, we're still we, we yeah. are still in the era where we're feeling the reverberations from like Nintendo and Super Nintendo hard games that are like arcade hard games because just right. how things work. So yeah, even in 2007, mm -hmm. we're still trying to shake out of that and figure out what the new design par uh, paradigms are for games. Yeah, two years later, yeah, Demon yeah. Souls comes right. out. Right, <laughs> totally on me. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah, no, they were definitely it was it was you and uh, Fumito Ueda were the two people <laughs> that, that Miyazaki was inspired by. <laughs> that would be incredible. I would die. It is really popular in Japan, but I think it's more of a niche popular. Like, it has very loud vocal fans in Japan. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get messages from them and stuff. They're very nice. Yeah, Aww. it's like Japan and Brazil are the two like non uh, American speak American speaking English speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say non non American, but I'm like, there's other places that speak English. <laughs> oh no, I, I used to get angry comments saying I was pronouncing words incorrectly <laughs> <laughs> because I wasn't saying them in the American way, and I'm just like, is it? Uh, do you ever get comments about spelling things wrong? Like, why yes. is there a U in color? <laughs> yes. See, at least you're not like me, where like, on Twitter, where it's just like just typos every day. It's like, at least you can be like, even if you made a mistake, you'd be like, no, no that's just Australian. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you get a lot of fan mail? Not so much anymore. It's finally kind of died out. I'll get tweets occasionally still, but um, I used to all the time. I used to get like hate mail constantly. Hate mail? Oh yeah. Why? Because it made people really angry. I had people like they they send me pictures of their like broken monitors and oh stuff. And <laughs> I, I have contr I have contributed to real material damage in the world. I'm not <laughs> sure how I feel about that, but oh. Well, if the point of art is to elicit emotion, uh, right? That's true. 
And, um, you know, and I would always respond really nicely. And usually, pretty much 100% of the time, once I responded back nicely, they would be like, oh, well, actually, though, I do love the game. Thank you very much. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it always worked out just to be nice. Because really, I want people to have a good time, ultimately. Um, low lows are part of having high highs a lot of the time. But, mm. like, I don't want people to break their stuff. I don't consider that a victory, but it's hard to like, you can't really put a limit on for some people saying like, yeah, stop playing now. You're going to break your controller. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. So you wrote it in multimedia fusion. If you can call that coding. Yes. <laughs> this was the first thing you worked on. You said that you finished, but you worked on things before. I worked on other things before this. Yeah. Um, I worked, I made games in ZZT right. and Megazooks. Yeah. Familiar with either of those. Very old. Which yeah. are old, yeah, DOS ASCII based game makers, which are, are probably actually closer to real coding mm. than MMF2, <laughs> to be real. Uh, MMF2 is. I've used it before. Barbaric. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You can't even name your variables, there's not even sub events. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um I bought it because I pirated it at the time because that's what you did in two thousand seven. Only in two thousand seven. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly none of that going on these days. No. It's surprisingly less though. It is, it is. Well, it's the convenience factor. Yeah. Everything's gotten so much easier to get legally. And most people don't want to pirate things. Yeah, I've also heard people just say in general, like I was so used to being poor as a kid that now that like I have money, it's like I feel like I need to. The only people I still hear talk about piracy, uh, besides people in other countries, are people who are poor. In which case, yeah, uh, do whatever. Sure. <laughs> I pass no judgment. Um, so, but it was on sale for like ten bucks. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll want to try and like rebuild. I want to be the guy in it and like kind of like fix it up one day and guess i owe you guys 10 bucks so i bought it i loaded up the code i was looking around it i'm like this is no person should be making a game in this like what the hell yeah it, it was it's derived from like the old click and play program from like 96 yeah yeah it's the same studio they just kind of built on it yeah so i used to use click and play when i was like 11 12 yeah i didn't want to use those because I figured I can't make graphics that aren't two right, color right. ASCII graphics like in ZZT and uh, Megazooks. Um, so then the alternative there was to steal most steal most of my graphics, <laughs> and that worked out. And then it turns out I actually yeah. can do sprites, and I just <laughs> never <laughs> turns out actually. That was the one question I, I had. The one question I actually wanted to ask was what came first? Because did you make Create Geef? Um, Craig Geef is roughly inspired by, um, I forgot what it was called, but there's some weird Mugen. That, cause that's what I was going to ask is cause there's also a Mugen Craig Geef. And I was wondering which came first was the, I want to be the guy one or the no, Mugen. No, no, no. The Mugen Craig Geef. Craig Geef as a concept is mine. Um, the idea right. of like a weird robot mutant Zangief that like breathes fire and stuff came from some Mugen variant of. of uh, I think Zangief. I've seen that. He's like got gray gotcha. skin. Okay. Yeah, 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 or something like that. Like, I don't yeah. entirely remember. There are many. There are many mecha. Yeah. You might think mecha, mecha Zangief. Zangief. Yeah, it could be. Uh, uh, there are many mecha Zangiefs in Mugen. God, I used to love Mugen. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that was that's as far as I ever got to game development was my brother and I making and doing ridiculous stuff on Mugen. Yeah, yeah I never managed to get anything going in Mugen. And I so tried. like this is like a really really ambitious like first thing to release when you consider like the structure of it and everything. It's like this full on Metroidvania we would call it now. Yeah, design. Yeah, because a lot of the the ones that came after things like this, I think remember there was one that was just called Unfair Platformer. It was basically just a line that you went down, and there were hazards. Whereas what you did was it's a full like if you looked at the map, you would think this is like this is this full non-linear 
multiple branching paths, different bosses you have to kill in like different orders to unlock parts. It's it's incredibly like ambitious. Especially for multimedia fusion too. Oh look, I can't say that too much. Uh Not Too Love Two was also on oh, yeah, Multimedia that's true, Fusion yeah. Two. Which is ridiculous. Yeah, me and uh me and Conjack have uh uh a mutual curse where we, he used multimedia fusion two. And then we both went on to right. construct classic, which is like MMF two. Um, but like more civilized, but they stopped support of it midway through oh. uh, both our developments. Oh, no. So we were stuck with these dead engines. Oh, it sucked. Yeah. Um, I do like that workflow though. Like the, um, MMF two's type of like that yeah. type of visual coding, I think is like really nice. I find like all this cool, all the stuff now does the weird yeah. like node based stuff, and I find that's actually more confusing. Yeah, no, I use Gato, which is entirely node based. Which took it took me a very long time to wrap my head around like how to do nodes because I'd previously had I'd previously used like a hierarchical like object thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my uh, that's on my list of things yeah. to try yeah. using after Brave Earth. I mean, I'm probably actually going to try and code most stuff for once, because I yeah. can kind of code now. Yeah, no, I, I just remember, like, around the time you were doing that, I was in the the early RPG Maker community, and everyone was coming up with these really kind of ambitious projects, and none of them ever got finished, because no one realistically has enough time yeah. to make, like, a 40-hour JRPG. But, like, you you kind of, like, oh, yeah, made something that is pretty sprawling. Yeah, it's kind of surprising, but I was able to iterate content pretty fast. It was the whole game took six months, I think. Oh wow! Yeah, um, as opposed to the fucking years and years and years and years of braver, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mostly because it's and mostly just because of burnout. If I'm going to be honest, it's hard yeah, to work yeah. on a project for a long period of time. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are. That's why there's a graveyard of RPG maker games that stretch for miles is because yeah. you know it can only be a passion project for yeah. so long right yeah and that's why like the ipg at least in when i was doing it which was like pre it being legal so it was the old like 2k and 2k3 engines it was stuff like you right, exactly and like now you get like horror games and narrative games but not yeah, that many corp, like uh, like yeah corpse party yeah but it's not that many like traditional jr although I, i'm seeing more and more of them now but like the traditional sort of jrpg structure of like the big epic quest with the party and everything yeah 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 i think one of the nice things with making jrpgs now is the realization now with how indie games have gone that like actually you don't need to make a 40 hour jrpg yeah yeah like actually if it's short that's almost a feature (laughs) like yeah big same yeah 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 so like with i want to be the guy it's like i just kept making content because i just thought it was fun and yeah. I had friends who were playing it. I was doing what everybody ended up doing with I Want to Be the Guy to one of my friends, the guy who actually voiced the kid, actually. Uh, I thought that was you. No, no, <laughs> I'm the guy. Uh, pitch it. Oh, right, okay. No, so my friend, Paul, he has this amazing voice range. Um, he can go super high, he can go super low. Like, there's no voice modulation or anything on it. The only thing I made it, I just bit crunched it to make it sound like a compressed old PlayStation 1 kick. Uh, he just do that, and he still sometimes when I hang out with him. He'll just do the voice. Um, oh wow! And he's just one of those people that gets really mad at games, <laughs> <laughs> but he he's also still willing to play them. So I would just make this to troll him, and me and my friends would sit there and we'd watch him play it, and he'd just get furious. Um, and that just motivated me to keep going. Then I started uploading it, and then people, um, people in various communities I was a part of started talking about like talking about it and started spreading and everything like that and all that positive feedback kept pushing me on so that by the by the point where like if it was just something i was doing for fun i would have quit i'm like well you know if i make like two more bosses and an ending i have a whole game so i finished it yeah <laughs> oh. yeah and a lot of the structure and stuff kind of came by accident like it was just me winging it i had no great plan or anything I knew I wanted to have, like, I wanted it actually to be a denser maze. Yeah. Like, where you'd go back to screens that you were, I mean, you kind of do that, but more in, like, loops. Mm. Um, instead, instead of being, like, a dense grid, like a lot of those old, like, DOS PC games and stuff like that. 
Yeah. Um, right. So, but it did establish a lot of the things I, I decided were important to me in level design and stuff like that. Stuff that even now I still think about. Just the way, like, screens flow and the shapes of them and stuff like that and how all those things contribute to make things memorable and, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I learned all that making I want to be the guy. Like, I didn't go in with any mm. of that. It was just one of those things where it's like, oh, like, oh, this doesn't look good. And just, like, actually using the art background I did have, because I at least drew and stuff like that to um, inspire how my levels looked, even if I was using, like, mostly stolen assets or really simple assets. And it worked. <laughs> A lot of luck involved, honestly. Yeah, it did. Before we go on, does anybody else have any, like, I want to be the guy questions that they really want to ask. Oh, okay, yeah, I have one. I have one. Did you get annoyed at how many people were constantly let's playing it on YouTube around 2009, 2010? No, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. And then all those people who did those videos made people download the games and that made me AdSense money. Oh, nice. Ah, well, there you go. I made decent bank off I Want to Be the Guy. Oh, cool. Well, that's good. I'm actually, I'm actually pretty glad. Yeah. Because a lot of people are like, oh, it's a shame you couldn't monetize. It's like, I did yeah. fine. I made, especially for that era. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Like, the amount of money I made now would be considered a failure for an indie game. But, like, at the time, nobody was making money. So, yeah. A plus. Um, yeah, I first saw the game on something awful on the something awful thread mm. yeah. and and i was just like i was like what is this nonsense and i immediately had to had to see it for myself that's funny that after all that time of just like slow beef being annoyed at yeah. i want to buy lots yes. of plays and <laughs> hammer kind of like we're not like super friends or anything like that but like we like we, we joke at each other at on twitter all the time and stuff we follow each other <laughs> like peace has been restored I showed Sin that video where it's just someone playing it in slow beef reading a book, and then every time he dies, he just goes, please stop, let's playing, I want to be the guy, and then goes back to the book. I mean, there is some truth that after a certain point, it's like, all right, guys, you're beating a, a dead horse here. Yeah. Uh, but then Twitch started happening, and that was a new resurgence, mm. and that had a new wave of um, both players and income. Like, uh, th th there's actually an arc with that. Um, and that was like, that was actually its biggest point was what? when Twitch happened, because it's more, it's even funnier when you're there joking in chat about their dramatic irony that's to come. And the natural, the nature of like Twitch streams made sitting through all the deaths and repetition a little bit more ter uh, tolerable because you're sitting there joking around and like dissing the person playing and stuff like that. So um, it worked even better in, in that realm. And then eventually Gaiden came out, and then that did okay. You know, it's not even really a full game, though, so... And then just trying to finish my Castlevania clone, which is what it is. Yeah. So, we can talk about it now. Tell us about the game you're working on now. Brave Earth Prologue, and it's called Prologue because it was going to be a small i was gonna try and make castlevania one i was gonna have dumb bosses super mm -hmm. super basic stuff i'm like i'm gonna make a short game that I can just do a little level design study uh to you know kind of stall for like certain engines to develop and stuff like that so i could make invest a lot of time in a um into a metroidvania which is still the type of game i really want to make yeah uh turns out this game has taken like eight years and is a lot <laughs> i'd say um i will say it's a um well over time it's a little less so but it started out as just a shameless castlevania clone because it was it was going to be free i wasn't going to sell it or anything uh but as time goes on i started developing my own voice within that like structure of a game uh, the more i'm like oh this has to be a thing now <laughs> So if anyone's ever like, why is it called Prologue? It's like literally it was gonna be a little game to lead to a bigger game. But now it's a big game to lead to what hopefully isn't gonna be another like eight years of my life. But it's a Metroidvania, so it's probably going to be. <laughs> uh, 
So um, it's just me taking a different stab at difficulty, going from uh, humor to trying to do that sort of slow, plodding, but rewarding type of challenge. And it's kind, it's Castlevania, it's Ninja Gaiden y, a little bit of Batman on the NES. I'm just trying to like develop that design space because one thing I found, like, as, as somebody who's a fan of classic Castlevania games, is like, all the games that try and be classic Castlevania games are generally not that good at being Castlevania games. They might still be good games, but like, I mean, I remember when I was um, in Japan at Bit Summit showing the game, uh, Jeremy Parrish, who's a huge um, Castlevania fan, he was playing it and he's just like, it's like, I've played a lot of Castlevania clones in my, my day, but this is the first one that's ever played, like, felt like it understood Castlevania. And that meant a lot to me. Uh, yeah, and I try not to be bound by that either. Like the game has like very different characters, so you have like uh, the main character named Voss Cruz, who's um, kind of this night lady who k- kind of has like the Belmont moves I said, k- limited jump control, not no jump control. Uh, but she's very weighty in the air, um, mm. sl- slow but reliable attack, and kind of like a a quasi Smash Brothers special attack slash sub weapon system. Uh but like her friend, you have um Sinlin the Mage who like she can like hover jump, she has full air control. She her pickups totally change her basic attack. Uh she attacks at range. And then like you have Naomi's brother who's almost a Souls character. <laughs> like or like rolls and a, like a charge up attack, like secret of model. So very different uses of this design space. Um, and because I'm a dumbass, because uh, um, what a smart person would do is you'd make a set of levels, and then you'd make multiple characters, and then you would say, "Hey, you could pick your character that you like." And I've taken this amount of levels, and by adding characters, I've made three times the amount of content with like minimal effort. That's what a smart person would do. I made different level tracks for each character. Oh, because oh. I was I was gonna I was gonna ask, is this like like is this Castlevania three? Like where you switch between Trevor and, and Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There is a um an unlock for beating the game is a Castlevania three mode where you can go through the game okay, and sure. like, even like switching between characters and stuff like that. But uh by default, like no. Like some characters share stages. And there's like usually different routes involved and stuff like that, but like yeah, no, they have each you have to play all the characters and get through all their stages to beat the game. Uh, people are going to hate that and it's one of the things that as a game designer it's like, "Oh, that was not a good idea, but I'm already committed, so that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it it has a very like NES Castlevania look to it as well. I try and stick to some of the actual limitations of the NES. Some of them. Uh, everybody cheats yeah yeah um yeah sh- uh, shovel knight did the same thing are there are there scan lines <laughs> you can turn on scan lines they're not very good i'll be honest there's limitations of the engine that prevented me from yeah i don't uh, like personally i'm not a big fan of scan lines so well at least not um i don't like uh, artificial art scan lines are terrible i just like them because they remind me of my childhood yeah so, see i like mm. scan lines i still have a crt that i have all my old uh, consoles hooked up to but um oh, very I'm, nice. I'm very picky about artificial scan lines so it wasn't something i put priority in early yeah. on and now later in the project i realized like oh this engine doesn't give me the type of shader control i need to make like right, right. scan line stuff that people would really like so that's a little disappointing maybe um there's a possibility that one day the um the game can get um ported not even ported like reinterpreted into this different engine that they did for um they did for yeah. iconoclasts which is how that's on a bunch of different right, consoles right. so if we get that treatment which is by the way if any of you guys make money and you think oh i'll, I'll throw money at this problem um after i use a scrappy engine you're talking about like um a five figure fix for your problem <laughs> just to give some people the background of how much stuff costs was iconoclast construct as well yeah it was construct classic oh wow i didn't know yeah so 
But yeah. they paid the money, and then they were able to get console ports and stuff from that. So we might end up doing that. Oh, the game okay, does well, right. well enough. If we do that, then yeah. we'll have an, uh, enough of an access to like the um, deeper guts that I could like commission somebody to make a really nice scan line thing. Uh, there's other things too that I right, hate, like right, there's pixeling. Yeah. Like some people are going to be really nitpicky about this, and I'm just going to have to apologize to them because the engine doesn't allow proper locking. Oh no! And and actually, if you play the game, like unless I did some like hardcore hacks, um, I mean it's only resolution. Um, like there's not like weird subpixel distortion, but like hmm. if you play the game at like two x resolution, you can have a character stand between two pixels, and you won't notice unless you look close. Uh, and that bothers me. But it's yeah. one of those things where, like, the reality of game design is, som- is sometimes that, like, things come that you don't like, and you just have to kind of deal with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's so annoying because, like, Construct 2, which there's no way to port a Construct classic thing to const- Construct 2, that just has a checkbox that says just, like, it's a pixel game. Don't break the, don't break resolution. But <laughs> <laughs> making games is hard. <laughs> Make a dumb mm. game like I want to be the guy before you make any other games. Because even when you have experience, dumb, annoying things are going to happen that are going to make you mad and that you're going to be disappointed in. And you're going to have to try and explain to people who don't know how hard it is to make games why you didn't do certain things. Yeah. Why you're not, why, you know, you're going to deal with a bunch of people who who say you were right. lazy and that's why. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's always... The one, and I'll be the first person to admit I can be unfair to game yeah. developers at certain times. But the one, the one criticism that always rubs me the wrong way yes. is lazy. Because, hmm. like, even when a game design, even when it is lazy in certain situations, it's kind of like it, it, it doesn't matter because it ultimately still just comes down to time and money, right? Like, I'm lazy yeah, in my development right. of uh, Brave Earth, but that made the game take eight years. It doesn't make any of the features lazy. <laughs> Like the effort I put in is the effort I put in. Especially like like you're saying, working with uh, working with this engine that you kind of don't have a fine degree of control. Yeah, with. that's kind of one of the things where it's like, um, yeah. where I'm looking at like Godot, and I'm like, I'm yeah. like, oh, this looks so nice, but it's another relatively new engine that isn't super established. Mm. Do I want to bite the bullet yeah. again, or do I just want to use Unity like everybody else and just accept the fact that, like, no matter what, Unity will be alive probably ten years from now? Yeah, yeah. No, I remember I was using Godot, and then they updated, and then I opened my project, and everything was upside down. <laughs> Yeah. And I had no oh idea how God. to fix it, and it was quicker to just go through and manually rotate everything 180 degrees and just leave it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. Even working with Inconstruct, there's all sorts of, like, ridiculous hacks yeah, I have to do yeah. to make the game work. Like, I mean, yeah. I know this isn't, like, a super technical podcast, but, like, you would think writing code, I think even people who don't write under write code would understand this, that is, like, if you compile a piece of code, you can reuse that piece of code in multiple situations and it shouldn't like bloat mm. or anything. You just reuse this everywhere. So in construct, I think this applies to multimedia fusion too, as well, but like no games are big enough for this to be an issue for every, um, like layout, like every map, basically. Um, anytime you reuse code, it just makes a copy of that code. Oh no! So after I got to a certain amount of levels, the game would just take thirty seconds to open up, and it's like I can't Jesus. ship this. Like that's like Bloodborne screams well, from software, did? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. god! <laughs> that's yeah. True. So what I ended up doing was like, I'm like, okay, I'll have one screen, and then I'll just write a map loader and a map exporter and stuff, and load everything into one screen. Right. But then it's like at the point where it's like, well, why am I even using this tool if I have to do things real programmers have to do? Yeah, like, yeah. You're, you're not being useful now, but you don't know that until you're several years into a project, and then you're realizing, like, oh no, mm. <laughs> it's yeah. it's stressful. Mm. I I didn't have anything yeah, like, like that. Like, I don't want to be the guy, except for the fact that like I had massive hard drive failure one time, and I thought the whole game was lost midway through. Oh, no. oh, my oh God. God. there's a copy from a day ago on my mom's laptop that I would occasionally borrow to do like remote work with. Mm-hmm. So I lo- almost lost all of my one of the guy. Besides that, oh everything went pretty God. painlessly. Yeah. Because, like, we're friends with some 
developers who they like making like physics based games. They made one called Celestial Hacker Girl Jessica. That's like a marble madness kind of thing where you control a marble. That's a really good name. It is a good name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were talking about it the other day that like that was made in some version of Unity and then they updated Unity and that update changed something very minor about how physics were interpreted. Yes. And now it's all off and they just had to like frantically move the thing back to the older version of Unity. That is 100% uh, a big yeah. issue with Unity. Which is why yeah. Unity has all their old versions like super easy to download because yeah. they realize like the version you're on like if you're noodling around with unity be like oh new version cool new features but like sometimes when you're working on a game you just have to be like nope not gonna get that because i just need to make sure nothing changes especially if the development takes a period right. of years mm. where there are multiple iterations yeah but it gets really sad too then because if you have an old game and it's like, oh, I need to support this because something on a platform change. I need to like make a patch, and then you realize, like, oh, to even yeah. open this, I have to like download this multi gigabyte thing that I need for one pers- purpose. Uh, game development's a mess. <laughs> yeah, right. So, like, yeah, this also goes back to the um, the from software stuff, where like people always talk about like the huge, huge mess. That all those games are internally because it's like you make a game that yeah. big yeah. it's hard not yeah. to be a mess yeah and it's like running off like the same engine for about 10 years just with very minor tweaks oh yeah to, i uh, mean yeah the newest call of duty games still have sizable chunks of code that come from quick 2 oh wow yeah yeah i remember like looking at the like extracted bloodborne parameter files and it's just got all these references to mechanics from demon souls in it because they've just like <laughs> just left them there and repurposed them i mean yeah like yeah. a lot of the sounds are also i did. Yeah. like if you if you if you played thousands of hours like demon souls like i did when you first played bloodborne you were like oh i recognize those bells <laughs> yeah, right? it's like yeah. um like once you have something that works it's like it's hard to give it up mm. um pretty much every game designer i know has like a, a pocket full of ways they do things like whether it's code they can actually reuse yeah. or just general techniques for doing certain things like yeah yeah well that's that's very much the way that human beings optimize right and make work is we take stuff we've done in the past and we repurpose it into Oh yeah, you even like think thinking now to like when I illustrate or when I I haven't actually illustrated a picture yeah. in years at this point actually. But like one of the hard things that gets hard about the uh, art uh is you'll be used to drawing certain things such as in a certain way because you kind of like you kind of turn them into symbols in a way, a lot of art people say. Um because you're trying to find ways to optimize to make this a solvable problem in a reasonable amount of time. Um which is what probably the nice thing going to sprite work for me because that was a big break where I couldn't you I still had all the art experience but I had to reinterpret a lot of stuff and be like oh actually I'm starting fresh so like I can actually level up kind of artistically working in this new medium and like you said, working within the constraints of the NES like how that would have oh it's so nice things. it's so not. Yeah. It's so nice to um, choose where you cheat to, where it's like, I want to have more frames of animation than I could reasonably have, because animating yeah. at that size is really fun. Because you don't have to mm. worry about having a super, um, like, your anatomy doesn't have to be spot right. on, right? Like, if yeah. you have wonky anatomy on a big sprite, it shows. But if you have like kind of a silhouette yeah. moving, basically, which is what you ha- kind of have to have on an NES-looking game with like fluid animation, it just looks it looks cool. Like it's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pe- people talk about how the console generation that aged the worst wasn't isn't the NES or the Super Nintendo. It's like the Sega Saturn, PlayStation One era models that just look terrible now. <laughs> when you look, oh, back. you have the texture warping and everything like that. Oh, uh, when I played through Kingsfield, yeah. I was getting tripped out just like walking back and forth in front of a wall and watching the wall texture just like warble around. Oh yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, right. I'm actually trying to write a shader that replicates that. There are examples of that that are out there. 
<laughs> oh, good. I should try and look that up. I saw somebody actually talking about this recently. I should try and look that up for you. There's There was a term for that, um, the glitch that happened. I think it's like something spline, whatever. Um, like there's an error. Yes, yeah, so it's to do with the A fine texture coordinates. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's kind of incredible that finally, even now, that aesthetic is coming back. Because I remember when I was making yeah. OB Guys, yes. like people were like, oh, nobody's ever going to make like PlayStation 1 nostalgia games because they look like ass. And like, I'm like, yeah, 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 you're right. And then like part of me was like, is that true? It's like, well, yeah, actually, it turns out, yeah. no, uh, dead I'm, wrong, because people are doing it. Yeah. There's all, the, there's all the great puppet combo horror games, which I don't know if you're familiar with those, but that's it's probably the best example of someone who just nails yeah. the PS1. Uh, yeah. yeah, I started following a, a Twitter that just, like, retweets low-poly indie games, and there's a lot of them. Yeah, because it's just, it's just a really nice workflow. It's probably easier to make a low-poly yeah. indie game than it is to make a 2D indie game at this point. Yeah, because one, once you have Blender and you can, like, make a very basic model and rig it, like, that's kind of it. You don't have to worry about drawing frames. Yeah, it's really, really yeah. a lot less labor. And all the engines are tuned yeah. to making that sort of content. Yeah, so that's probably going to get much, much more uh, popular. Yeah, and it like even dawned on me recently when I was playing um, a lot of old PlayStation games. And I was playing that. I, and I used to play old PlayStation games on my PlayStation 2. It's like, oh, look at this muddy mess. And then, you know, I was playing them on um, yeah. an actual PlayStation. And looking at, mm. like, how the graininess and everything works. Because it doesn't have, it doesn't try and smooth it out like the PlayStation yeah. 2 does. It's just like. Like this yeah, actually looks yeah. better and kind of has a charm to it. And then looking at games like Metal Gear yeah. and like Vagrant Story, which are like awesome. Vagrant Story looks awesome. Vagrant Story has aged probably better than any PlayStation One yeah. game. And if you like look I've it up seen. online, yeah, definitely, you will see so many screenshots of people who have like texture filters on it, and I want to cry. It's like, mm. Yeah, yeah. It's like no. Because, like, those those low-poly models look good at that low resolution. I think the problem right, exactly. is people were blowing them up to a high resolution and saying, well, this looks be- this looks terrible. And it's like, yeah, because it's you're seeing... It's when you seeing- blow them up to 16 by 9 yeah. when they're supposed to be at 4 by 3, you know? Yeah, they meant to, it's like the resolution of the SNES. Yeah, like, um, there's an image I love yeah. um, of showing comparison stuff from... Uh, oh, no, where did I make this image? I don't even remember. I'm an old man. <laughs> um, so, like, the PlayStation version of Metal Gear has really, really good use of, like, low-resolution textures, even by... Play- like, they're low-resolution mm. res- even by PlayStation 1 era. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you have the PC version of the game. So you look at, a like, um, like the side of a box on the PlayStation version, and it's a super crisp... Because everything in the game is designed around right angles. Because right angles, right. if you have non-interpolated pixels, meaning like when you rotate a texture around, I mean, I'm sure you two know this, but I don't know who on the podcast who listens would. Um, when you rotate around a texture, do you smooth it out or not? Like when you scale it up and more modern things smooth it out so you don't have like big pixels, whatever. Uh but on Metal Gear, well, just the PlayStation 1 in general, they don't have that. So you get these blocky, jaggy textures. But if you put everything at a right yeah. angle, you get sharp lines. So you'll have these boxes that are like 8x8 eight eight textures, and they look great. But if you take an 8x8 eight eight texture and you blow it up, and you like interpolate the, the pixels, it just looks like a fog of blue. And it's like people still release the PlayStation version, not the PlayStation, the PC version of Metal Gear with those textures in and didn't realize, like, oh, wait, we made a mistake here. We should really either replace this texture or turn off um, texture filtering on certain textures. Mm. Right, yeah. And, like, I, I, for the same reason, I kind of don't like a lot of the remasters of. Uh, PS1 games that are coming out where it's like the same models but with higher resolution textures on them because oh, there's just this no, weird incongruity terrible. to me that it's like well, did, did you did you play the Silent Hill HD collection because no. it was famously it was famously like like it was it looked terrible 
because like all of that stuff was designed specifically only to run at certain resolutions on the PlayStation one and the and PlayStation two. And when they took the silent, they took Silent Hill one and Silent Hill two, and I think Silent Hill three, I don't remember, which were games that were pushing the boundaries of graphics at the time. And they brought them onto HD and they look fucking awful. The fog is broken. Like they look, broken yeah yeah um in a way that it's not just that they look bad it's that they look like they were square pegs jammed into circle holes <laughs> fog in general is something that suffers a lot when you translate games to different um different like engines and technology because even like um there's mm-hmm. just like some like uh assassin's creed games on uh the playstation 3 or well, whatever that generation that got like the like 4k hd remasters and whatever and like I was looking at screenshots of people yeah. showing off like how certain key shots that had like like this certain amount of like atmospheric fog and stuff like that to look good, like that's removed or like doesn't work with the new engine or whatever, and it just looks worse, even though the textures are high or whatever. Yeah. Or right. um the first time I played Shadow of the Colossus was the PlayStation 3 version. And I'm like playing it, I'm like, it's nice that this runs like fast, but I kept looking at videos of the PlayStation mm. 2 version. I'm like, this looks so That's much That's not better. the right version of that game to play, for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. like, you know, I ended up putting it on my PlayStation 2 because like, I want to play it like this. I don't care if it slows down. The slowdown is almost, it almost works. And then there's sometimes it's a little too much, yeah. but I'll take that little bit too much to get the game as it was intended, which is why I haven't played the PlayStation 4 remake, it's, but like. It's, it's fantastic. Right. You got you can't take a set of artistic decisions and then just adapt them without having some sort of very obvious loss. It's just I can't think of any games that do it super well. Uh I guess like some of the Metal Gear HD collection stuff's okay. But at the at the very best you're okay. Hmm. It's like like it doesn't right. offend you in an obvious way. Um, to really do it, you have to make a new set of artistic decisions, which is what the PlayStation Four Shadow of the Classes did. It's like we just have to start start from first principles, and even though we're gonna have the same boss and the same basic gameplay, like all our key shots and everything like that, we're just gonna make them look as good as we can by our own standards of what good looking is, because uh, that's the only way to do it. Being authentic is only gonna make you worse in the long run. If you want authentic play the place well i mean you look like you look at what capcom is doing now with resident evil oh that's even another level yeah that's like right that's not even just like yeah it's not even fair to call that and shadow of the classics remakes in the same breath like shadow of the classics like it's rebuilt right. might be a better way to put it well yeah. yeah um resident evil 2 is just like ground floor like yeah total do-over just build it again. Yeah, just like let's just take some yeah. vague ideas and like go from there. Yeah, yeah Capcom's been like kind of killing it lately. Yeah. They've been killing it in everything except for fighting games. <laughs> yes! Oh my god. I am like a huge fighting game dude, and I have still never played yeah. Street Fighter oh, yeah. V. Have, have you? Oh, you! Oh, I was going to ask if you played Gil yet, but I, I guess not. No, just from like even from the initial release and how much of a disaster it was. I'm like, oh, this looks less fun than four, and I was already kind of iffy on four. I, so I didn't like four at all, and I liked playing five. But man, if five wasn't a disaster, and my 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 poor brother who is such a huge Street Fighter guy is still trying to convince me that Street Fighter Five is good, and and it's been <laughs> years now, and. <laughs> I'm just like, no. no. I appreciated Street Fighter 4 more in retrospect after watching all the grand fi- uh, finals at Evo of Street Fighter 5 because I realized like all the things that were missing. Because well, there's no footsies in, in 5. There's no footsies. There's no, um, like, you don't get people, uh, the, the, the screen space doesn't matter as much. Right. Like, the fight for returning to center screen and getting neutral, getting out of quarters is so strong in... Um, because it's it, mostly a rush down, or at least at the highest level in Street Fighter V. Like, obviously, for everyone else, it's, you know, whatever. But at the highest level, it's mostly just a rush down game. That's the direction a lot of fighting games are going in general. It frustrates me a lot. Because I think it's like, I think it's a fine gameplay style, but I think it's like the most boring. I think it's, a, I think it's good to have rush down characters. Right. 
It's like you can't make a game around like Ken mix-ups and overheads. Oh, this podcast is all over the place. As a Ken player myself, I preferred it when I was the one rushing people down, not getting rushed down by like literally everybody. <laughs> oh, I could say this about every fighting game, like as they go on. That's why King of Fighters is doing well now, because that was King of Fighters from the start. Never yeah. changed. Yes, yeah, <laughs> King of Fighters has always thought about just... that. And although you, you, what I'm learning a lot about the new SNK games is that actually the artistic style of those games was a bigger deal for me than I thought it was. Oh, they're so good. Because like the new Sam show and the new and KOF 14, like it's it's I'm missing something there. And I'm I'm realizing that like oh the artistic style of those old games was actually a way bigger deal for me than I thought it was. You, you know who the new SNK is? It's Tekken. And I don't like to I don't like 3D fighters, but you look at Tekken and how stylish every character oh in those my games God. are. That's like, amazing. That's that like lineage of just like I, I mean I I am a guilty gear player personally. I am okay. That's my. Right. And, and again, like I could say the same thing, like um, I like I like um, Exert enough, but like same direction as Street Fighter five, where it's like more characters with more rushdown, more kid yeah, overhead. Definitely. Stuff like that. Um, but oh, my God, Strive. Strive looks really, really good, though. I'm pretty excited for it. But I'm, I'm actually OK with like the major changes they want to make to the game, because like my thoughts almost like. I like Exert enough, but if I was left to my own devices, I'd rather play Plus R still. Yeah, me too. Uh, but like, oh, we're going to do something that's like way different. I'm like, oh, I'd ra- oh, like, oh, if it's way different, then I have a reason to play both these things. I, I don't feel like now that there's a Plus R community re-rising, I don't feel like there's a reason for me to really play Exert anymore, except for the fact that like, oh, there's a player base that I have access to. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about finding games will always be that the newest version will always have the most the biggest number of people that you can play against which always fosters a larger uh yeah um, and it's very lucky when a game manages to pull a situation off like guilty gear does where it almost has like its super turbo version where there's always going to be players that play this one classic version of the game yeah i mean there there are still people playing slash (laughs) i love i wish i knew people who played slash i I love slash slash Johnny so much. Okay. Oh, this is a this is a conversation nobody listens to this podcast. Yeah, no, this is a conversation that, that you and I will have. Oh my god! After. Let me just talk about <laughs> Miss Finer Jack, Miss yes. Stamp Jackhound we'll from Mel like Boots and Miss Finer Johnny. We, we have a few this. listeners who play fighting games. But look, it makes sense because the music that like I would say, and I want to be the guy. I borrowed a lot of music. Because everybody knows That's where that music generous. from. Yeah. Like, like, but like, like everyone knows, like, oh, this is the DuckTales music. This is what I didn't steal anything. I stole Home Sweet Grave from Guilty Gear Issaca. That song's mine now. <laughs> Nobody is ever going to listen to that song and think, oh, Guilty Gear Issaca. I love that game. No, it's like, oh, see, I want to be the guy's song. I robbed, I robbed Dark System Works and I owe them an apology. I stole that song from <laughs> well, I'm sure they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sure they are real torn up about an obscure song from Boost Mode and Guilty Gear Isaka. So I forgot to do something earlier. Maybe we could do it now. There were a couple of questions on Discord. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something we should do. So it's all the fighting game stuff. Is that going to be on the Patreon too? Um, it depends on what my muse tells me. Yeah, the, the muse is. <laughs> Mm. The muse is a point of contention. Oh my god, oh my god, Richie recently met the muse. Richie, can you describe the muse real quick? Sin's muse is a small floating cat with wings and a glass of alcohol. Oh, okay, see, I was I was thrown off for a moment because I thought you were going to start with, well, it's a bottle. <sighs> But you got back well, around to the alcohol. Okay, good. No, the worst thing is the the muse appears regardless. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what she's been doing. She'll just randomly announce that her muse told her something. Like, much like this discussion <laughs> where I had no idea what the topic was and who would be on it. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad I only d- took like three notes. You should have seen this coming, Kayan. It's on you. I was so like generous with the signs of where this was gonna go. 
No, you made it clear I shouldn't do too much research. I did spend a lot of time on Noclip looking through Dark Soul, the Dark Souls maps, but to be fair, I would do that anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> we should mention that you made the Dark Souls map viewer. Yes. Yes. Really? I was unaware of that. So, a guy named Vlad ripped the collision data. Right. Right, because I want to make sure credit goes where credits do, and he put it with I I, I don't know if he it's a ma- uh, a model viewer he made or some stock model viewer, uh, and the model viewer sucked for maps because you kind of s- like rotated around the center point of everything. You couldn't really go do like a fly through whatever. So I remember I messaged him like, "Hey Vlad, can you like convert these into like object files?" So I took it. I took it into Unity. I made one of the first map viewers are like kind of like relatively easier to use and that inspired the guy who made no clip to make no clip that website which is like the best way to look at any of this stuff no clip that website is like one of the best websites there is for somebody who's interested in like level design or video games um especially now that you can load up like whole areas of dark souls and look at them it also reminds me, do you guys know anybody who has the, like, map collision data for Bloodborne? Because I really want to look at that game. Uh, maybe. I'll tell you later. <laughs> somebody's got <laughs> someone's to rip that for me. Okay, so before we go, um, okay, there's a couple of questions on Discord. Um, okay. Mary Doc is asking, what are your thoughts on a ROM hack called Battle Kid? I love Battle Kid. Uh, Battle Kid's not a ROM hack. Yeah, it's original. Right, it's an original NES game made from the ground up. Oh, that. I know what um, you're about. Yeah, Civic's a cool dude, uh, the guy who made it. He sent me a copy for free, and like those carts, like especially back then, those carts cost like a decent amount. Like the like buying old NES games are expensive because yeah, yeah. So he he fronted it. It's like this is the only thing I asked him for. He's like, hey, can I sell this? I'm like, yeah. Can you send me a cart? And he said, absolutely. I played through the whole game. I love it. It's much. To say it's an I Want to Be the Guy fan game is almost giving I Want to Be the Guy too much credit. <laughs> it takes some mild inspiration from I Want to Be the Guy, but it's mostly its own great thing. So I love Battle Kid. Thank you. So Princess Gratzer is asking, have you ever played games directly inspired by I Want to Be the Guy, like I Want to Be the Boshi or I Want to Be the Fan Game? Uh, I played a, like like through like half a fan game. Uh, I never i've never played bashi that was after i gave up on trying to keep up with fan games i think i think bashi is the most successful one yeah yeah but the bashi came like i feel like one or two years later so i was already burned out on playing uh fan games um even fan game itself one of the the first big successful ones was like it was too much for me to keep up with because like getting through one i want to be the guy game is like <laughs> already whatever so like having all these games come out super fast uh it, like now there's like eight thousand of them on one website right so like i gave up after a certain point but i've played like uh battle kid which is inspired loosely um uh, 1001 Spikes, I feel like, probably has some I Want to Be the Guy inspiration. Played through that. We, You mentioned Super Meat Boy earlier. I mean, that definitely has some some inspiration in it. I don't think directly, though. Edmund never played I Want to Be the Guy. Well, okay. We, I had that conversation with him. He's like, yeah, you know, he's like, I gotta be honest, I never played the game. I just knew it was really popular. I'm like, that's cool. You can put me in the game. I don't care. Interesting. He's like, you don't have to. You don't have to prove that you're a real. I want to be the guy fan to me. Just no, do whatever. I would. I would have put money on that being the case. But huh, that's interesting. But there's all sorts of levels of inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like Kaizo again. Right. The zeitgeist was moving in that direction. Yeah. So we're, we're all on the same wave. Yeah. I mean, we talked about like Cat Mario earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. The Flash. Based difficult game and then the impossible Mario hack were like really big. Yeah. Yeah. And that's at the point now where the, the ripples of the waves are so dispersed that like anything I play probably has some minute speckles of DNA that comes from imprints I made at some point. And it's come full circle with uh with the Super Mario Maker levels that people have made. It's it's all come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a time where um I think it was Polygon came to my house with a, a Wii 
uh, not a Wii, uh, Wii U, and they're like, hey, make a Mario Maker level. Because they were doing this for all sorts of developers. And they're expecting me to make something horrible with spikes. And I basically made a ghost house out of 1 1. Okay. From uh, level 1 1 oh. from Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. Where, like, you think you know where things are going and stuff. I pull, like, classic ghost house tricks to make it be like, oh, no, it's not actually 1 1. Right. It's like a weird remixed version. Yeah, that was fun. Oh. They were looking at me like I was crazy when I was just remaking 1-1. One, one. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm like, no, trust me, I got this. It's like, just pet my dogs, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ed the Dungeon Master is asking, um, how do you manage a project like that through to completion? Well, that, that one wasn't too hard because um, it only took six months. And it was a perfect time because I was in college and college is a good time where it's like, I don't have really any other responsibilities. So the period, (laughs) so it happened basically, it happened from summer, not for everybody in college, but for me, I got to bum it pretty well. So that, I think I made the game through like the start of summer to about like winter, like right when like finals would start and whatever like that. So I basically hit the stretch of time where you can be the most irresponsible. Uh-huh. And I made a game. Worked out. Um I um Brave Earth is a little harder. You have to um make a bunch of money off of a, a game already, put it in a bank, live like a poor person, have family that will that are willing to put up with you. Mm. Uh like like there is no way to make really ambitious um, art like that without having like huge structures in place, even for something like yeah, game. yeah, yeah. Uh, like I live with my parents; I have a great relationship with my my whole family, so it works out for me. Um, but a lot of people are like, "That's like I can't live like that." It's like you have to look for the advantages that you have in your life, yeah, definitely, and you have to lean on them because there's really yeah. no other way. It's like anybody who tells you that they just kind of like guts and effort and didn't have anybody help them, they're probably lying or they're so special that you can't take any advice from them. Uh, but they're probably lying. <laughs> like Kojima, whenever he reminds us that he started from ground up four years ago without any help. Kojima is such a weird, a weird case because like Sony, yeah, because yeah. because so, sometimes he because he overreaches a lot, but at the same time, like sometimes people like feel like undercredit him. It's mm. like yeah, but like how much of the work is he really doing? I'm like the dude built Metal Gear Solid One out of fucking Legos. <laughs> yeah, like he is he is hands on, but he does get a little in his own head sometimes. I remember like. During the development of two, he like had to check into hospital a few times because he just wasn't sleeping, and he'd like yeah. made himself physically ill, yeah. like just working around the clock. Mm. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he's not everything he says he is, but he's more of what he says than he is than a lot of other people. Redgrave, did you say he got a blank check from Sony? I mean, he basically had to have shade. <laughs> That's not shade. That's that's pretty much exactly what happened. Was after yeah, no, yeah, it's after real. He got fired by Konami in well, officially in 2016, but unofficially, like a year earlier than that, he pretty much went to Andrew House and got a blank check to start Kojima Productions. Oh snap! Yeah, no, that's it. And the thing is, like, uh, like I really like Kojima as a game designer, and I think he makes really interesting games. Did you play Death Stranding? Uh, yeah, I thought it was great. And it has issues, but like it's really good. Yeah. It could have done with a little less whole lot. Man, those last like four hours are rough. <laughs> yeah. To get through. Yeah, that would be where I would agree with that. Um Yeah. The, you can see me break down during that live on this very <laughs> channel. Like it's rough to get through. And I really I really enjoyed the time I was playing Death Stranding. Yes. The times I wasn't yeah. playing Death Stranding, those were a bit more difficult. People who say Kojima should just give up on games and make movies clearly have never played a Kojima game. Or they've played too many Kojima games. <laughs> yeah. And they've just, they have Stockholm Syndrome for cutscenes. But yeah, this other thing is, like, he's uniquely interesting in the AAA space, but there's a lot mm. of developers that if given the chance from like lower down 
that if you gave that type of money to could do equally interesting things. He's just in a unique situation because yeah. history favors the him. The first thought I had when when the first gameplay trailer of Death Stranding came out was, this is an indie game that someone injected $400 million into. Yeah. Yeah, the, the BT mechanics really made me think of like, some like high concept Unity horror game that would have people would have been let's playing in like 2011. Yeah, <laughs> yes, he is a he is a special individual, but there are a lot of special yeah. individuals out there. And yeah, they yeah. do not get yeah. blank checks. I'm all for more games with that kind of budget that are just a bu- this bunch of weird bullshit. Mm-hmm. Give more millions to weird people to make like movies and games. Give Yoko Taro five hundred million dollars to do whatever he wants. Yes, like. I am all for that. Yes. Okay, thank you. And one last question. This is from Princess Shook. Would a console port ever be possible? Absolutely not. (laughs) Aww. Both for technical and legal reasons. Now, Sin, I know you very little, but if you have one talent that I've seen so far, it's you have this bizarre ability to bring people onto your podcast. And it certainly <laughs> has worked for me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm shy. Richard does the outro. <laughs> Sin is shy. You do this all the time. You like, you refuse to talk to people. Go, I'm shy. And then, by the way, I've pestered like all these people to come on and not tell them what the topic is. I'm, I'm shy. If I if I search my Twitter DMs for how many times I've been sent like. K-N in all caps the last month is probably like 25. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of muse visits this month, okay? <laughs> I see. I've had a lot of things to tell Kain, such as I want to be the war. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. <laughs> okay, before before we forget, where, where can people find your red grave and Kain? Uh, well, uh, the only real place I'm particularly active is on Twitter, which is just DMC Redgrave. Um, if you Google Redgrave Bloodborne, you'll find pretty much all of the stuff I've done for Bloodborne. I have, uh, no current plans for future content, but I'll, I'll, I would never say never, so, uh, it's entirely possible that I might come back to that someday when I have the energy and the motivation to do so. But yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and you can just find me if you just Google Redgrave or if you Google the Pale Blood Hunt, you'll find me. Uh, me too, also Twitter. Uh, Kayan Nasaki on Twitter. Um, I'm a very <laughs> heavy follow. <laughs> you be like, oh, you have a cool game. I'm going to follow you. I'm just going to be a weird <laughs> pervert on Twitter. Uh, it's like, I don't know why anybody follows me. It's like, oh, I'm going to tweet about wrestling. I'm going to tweet about everything but the thing you followed me for. But uh, if you want to follow me, please follow me. I do appreciate it still. Uh, if you just want to be interested in my game, look up Brave Earth, Prologue. It'll come up with the Steam Store thing. Put it on your wish list. It actually does help. If you look up I Want to Be the Guy, uh, I have a store on itch.io. If you haven't played I Want to Be the Guy, please put a zero in the recommended donations thing. Like, please. That's for people who are downloading the game again. If you've played I Want to Be the Guy, you want to throw me a few bucks because you're like, oh yeah, this thing made me happy years ago. I want to play it again. That's cool. But if you're new, put in a zero. Don't feel any guilt because I do have people tell me that they feel guilty. Do not. Just download the game. Have fun. It's free for you to have fun with. That is very sweet. It's illegal. You shouldn't be giving me money anyway. I'm, you're being real shady by even accepting those donations. I was thinking it. I wasn't going to say anything, but I was thinking it's, it. <laughs> they haven't taken me down yet, so I think the fact that I'm not selling it... Actually, this would be a whole podcast in itself. Fair Use actually does not care that much if you sell it or not. Yeah. It's a very minor point that's considered. <laughs> like, I mean, fair use is still untested in court. Like, all of this will be crumbling down one day when it actually goes to court. Yeah. Right. Fair use is whatever the court says yeah, it is at yeah. the time. One day, one of the big companies will actually take that stuff to court, and then and then all of Twitch is in a whole lot of trouble. But until then... Yeah. Yeah. But until then, enjoy I Want to Be the Guy.
You're in charge of the comments, because this setup I have now is not comment okay, proficient. Okay, that's fine. I can see the comments. <laughs>